this week I got to deal with it before the message. And uh, then I get to, of course, analyze myself on how I handled it. And as we get into this message today, you'll be able to do the same. So really prepare your hearts today for something that is going to touch an area perhaps you may not want to deal with, uh, but that God wants to deal with because there's freedom in hearing the word and knowing that he loves us. Amen? So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We ask that you would change our hearts, O God, and make us ever new. From glory to glory, we desire to be like you, transformed into your image. Protect and keep us. We pray for our government, the president, and the peace of Israel, as you have directed us to. Move in this place in your power, in your mercy, and in your grace. I hope those that have a calling upon their life, those with anointing, understand that today you will be used powerfully. So stir up that which is in you, because I believe God wants to do something extraordinary. And if you believe that, say amen. amen. Let me start off by saying to understand our salvation, we must constantly be reminded of who we are to emulate. You have to be reminded, reminded, reminded. I just met with someone yesterday that this part of this message applies to, and they walked up to me and they said, hi, do you remember me? And they're going on and on and on. And this was about 25 years ago when I met that person. And they were kind of, I think, a little hurt that I didn't recall them right off the bat uh, until they said their name. They didn't feel, I guess, in 25 years that time hadn't aged them a bit. But um, as a pastor, one of the things, because of the challenges that I face, um, I live in, uh, if I get this correctly, RAM mode. Does anyone know there's between RAM and ROM? Okay. ROM is your older memory bank type of stuff, you know, the stuff you have in your history. And then ROM is in the moment. And because of the challenges that sometimes I face, I live very much in the moment because if I were to sit and ponder about everything that could have, should have, and might have, or what might have, should have, could have, and would have, um, I can find that I'll have a difficulty dealing with what's going on in the present. I feel the past should be your past. And that is not to say that you can't enjoy them. You can't. I'm not talking about stuffing it at all. But I think that um, you need to move on. I think that's very important that you stay focused. Um, when you become too introspective and navel-gazing into your own mindset of what could have, should have, and would have, uh, could have, that you end up in a mode in which you no longer move forward, and Satan has you in the trick bag of introspection. Now, the Bible does say to look into yourself to see if you are saved, lest you be a reprobate. We are to check ourselves, but we're not to live in that check moment. You're to take yourself through the process and move forward. Turn to someone and say, it's time to move forward. For we as believers are constantly having to be reminded because one of Satan's greatest attacks against mankind is putting us in a position of shock or fear, which can lead to unbelief. And fear left unchecked confuses the mind, institutes a temporary paralysis of analysis. To access this thought process of God, we then become hindered because we are too busy trying to fix it in ourselves or ask the question, why? Leaving us in a position in which we are completely neutral and out of the fight. See, we are in a fight, not physical. We are of this world. Uh, we are in this world, but not of it. And what can happen is, is that he will put you in shocking positions where people catch you off guard. And in so doing, you can fall into a mode in which you forget how to handle it correctly. So let me give you an example. The door of salvation, contrary to some folks' belief, is not open forever. And a lot of people believe that, but it is not true. There comes a point in time where God will extend his hand for so long, and then you will continue to reject it, and he will accept your rejection. Notice I didn't say he is going to pull back from you. He's going to accept your rejection. And if you die in that position, the Bible says you go to hell. Okay? So there is a time frame, and it is not based on our time frame. I have a lot of people say, well, I don't know if I'm there yet. I'm not ready for it, this. I'm not. Everyone seems to be able to analyze themselves um, in a position of negativity that they're not ready to handle a challenge, um, except for the fact that the Bible says you are. So is it really that you're not ready, or is it just that you don't want to? And how much of our Christian faith is based on not what we want to do, and in so doing, we become stagnant? I don't want to. Well, that's fine. And, of course, as a 
Ambassador for God, he says, I appreciate your emotional expression, but it means nothing to the reality of what I've called you to. Your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price, and it's never always been about you, but it's about those who have to see a change in your life in order for them to grow because we all work together as the body going from glory to glory. So, just as salvation is not always open, neither is forgiveness, and that's what we're going to talk about today. It's been a while since I've talked about forgiveness and did not know I was going to have to exemplify it within 24 hours of before I preached it. So it was very exciting to yesterday, and I'll get into it in a moment. The door for an apology is not always open forever. As a child of God, you should realize that if you do not apologize quickly or forgive quickly, of those who are wronged, or if you don't seek forgiveness, your spirit life can be adversely affected from the favor of God, from health, from your finances. All kinds of things can literally go sideways on you very quickly if you don't keep short accounts. Never run book, if I may, on anyone, because some of you have got book on people that are as thick as war and peace. All right. We're going to have a book-burning service today. Hallelujah. You have to seek it quickly. That's why we read in Ephesians 4, 6. Do not, say do not. Tell your neighbor, do not. Let the sun go down on your wrath. And as I said before, it's because of what happens in the supernatural, in your soul, during, of course, the third watch, which is, of course, between 3 and 6. If you hold on to anything through unforgiveness, if you allow the sun to go down on your wrath, if you say, I'm not there yet, give me a couple of days. You're not allowed to have a couple of days. You got till 6 o'clock sundown. I don't care what it is. 6 o'clock sundown. Then after that, Satan can, of course, extract anything on you that you gave him permission by closing your eyes, shutting off your control of your soul, and allowing anything that the door has left open in your soul to enter in. A root of bitterness comes in between three and six. I've always said this. When couples get together and they fight and they don't, they go to bed angry. They end up having a menage a trois. Because Satan will sleep with whoever's womb is open to a root of bitterness. And he will impregnate that seed. And then down the road, when there is challenges in the emotional health of the marriage, that infection will arise and you will birth Destruction, divorce, adultery, and the effects on the children. This is why God offers us in Lamentations 3.23. He says, God's mercies are for the day. They are new every morning, but they are not given to those who are not in a position to receive. And I'll show you what that means because when we look at Matthew 6, 12, and we pray the Our Father, we ask God to forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have sinned against us. So you're either praying a blessing and trying to receive the mercies of God, or you have prayed a curse over yourself and have given access to Satan into your soul. A lot of people believe that our salvation is kind of a set it and forget it, made by Ronco. And it is not a set it and forget it. The Bible says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Deal with yourself. This is why you are to analyze yourself to see if you, of course, are a reprobate. You have to take things into account. Many people, as I love what, what Dr. Craig said uh, a couple weeks ago. He said, you folks are waiting on God and you're wrong. It's God who's waiting on you to enact that which he is trying to complete in you through him. In other words, he who has begun a good work will perform it, but you have to submit to what he's trying to perform. And do you give it a standing ovation or do you boo it as the process begins? So what I'm saying is, is we can hinder the grace and the mercy of God by holding on to that which God has commanded us to release of, to release or free ourselves from, so that we are constantly reminding ourselves, what would Jesus do? How do you handle these situations? So to be clear, Forgiveness granted or sought is to be done because Jesus told us to. And then Jesus went further, set the example on the cross, went to this extreme example while he's being beaten, he is naked, he is dying, and he says, Father, forgive those that are doing this to me. 
So when people say, I can't forgive because of what was done to me, it was too heinous. I say, not according to what the Bible says, because if Jesus can do it on the cross, you can do it for any insult you've ever encountered. In other words, God expects us to be gracious. And that is a kick in the head. Especially if you are someone who is prone more towards an aggressive position of, of violence, of non-grace, of not mercy. When you must extract the wrath of God because, of course, you feel you are justified and you have rights to do so. So here we go. God is a God of grace, and to seek forgiveness is something that we're told to do so so that we can live at peace with all men, irrelevant of the difficulty of the moment or what it might cost us in our pride, our emotional distress. Turn with me to Romans 12, 18, and I'll show you why. Ah, for the joy of the Lord. It says, if it is possible. Now, that's interesting because we know the Bible says all things are possible to those who believe, love God, and are called according to his purpose, those who believe. All things. So then, if that is a constant, what is the if factor in this statement? It's you. You're the if, not him. Well, God hasn't given me the strength to overcome. Oh, yes, he has. You can do all things through Christ. He will supply for your every need according to his riches and glory. It's that you don't choose to in your rebellion. So let's just be real. If it is possible, as far as it depends on who? You. Live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. If it's possible, which it is, if it depends on you, which it does, irrelevant of how they behave, live at peace. Are you with me? But how can we forgive as Jesus did, really? Well, yesterday, I had been battling a uh, condition known as bad broccoli slaw -onitis in which I was set free multiple times. But I feel great. Um, got a whole new wardrobe now. Skinny jeans are baggy. I'm good. Um, and so I was really not in a positive mode. And I was invited to a party from some people from the past. And I knew at the past there were going to be people from the past. And the thing with being around people from the past is they still want to see you in that past because they're too uncomfortable in their lack of growth to handle your growth. And so jealousy becomes an issue. So I was not down for this whole concept, but I just felt compelled, like the Lord was telling me, you've got to go. So out of duty and doing as I'm told, even in my issue, I took tons of medicine to stop the situation so that I could move forward. And sure enough... I encountered a few of those people, and they were disrespectful. And, but one of them I had not seen in years. I couldn't even remember them. And remember how I said the Ram Ram thing? Um, they were 1,652,954 gazillion people ago, problems and challenging situations. So I didn't recognize them. But as they spoke, they started to come to me who was speaking to me. And I remembered slowly. And as they spoke to me, they were going on about how they had been interhealed and they had been doing better and they're now going over to another church and all this other jazz. And, but I could still sense in my spirit um, something wrong, something like that broccoli salad. You know what I'm saying? There was something. Mm -hmm. And as I spoke to the individual, I had just said to them, I said, you know, because um, that individual referred to me by my first name and, and that was done purposely to be disrespectful. And I said, no, I'm still a pastor. I was your pastor back 25 years ago, and I still am today. Because they asked what I was doing. I said, the pastor. And um, I said, but in that situation you were in, I'm sorry you were hurt. And I said, I did tell the people that were involved not to do that. And because, of course, this individual's family was the one who instituted the church split, or part of it, 
um, she got very offended and she said, well, I can see you haven't changed. And she stormed away as if I was insulted by the fact that, no, I haven't changed. I'm still the pastor I was back in 1988 when God called me in the ministry. God's gifts and callings are all repentance irrelevant if you've moved on with your life, had babies, or done whatever. Your accomplishments have nothing to do with what God did in my life and who I am. And I don't cow tow to any sort of process of manipulation about who I am. I will continue to acknowledge God until I'm dead. I will continue to acknowledge my calling till I'm dead. I'm a pastor because I'm a pastor. It's blood in, it's blood out, it's ride or die, and the only way you get out is when you step out and into the fourth dimension. I don't understand pastors who retire. I don't believe in it. I don't believe that's even possible. You die in a pulpit with your boots on one day, and they just bring in somebody else and finish the message, if that's the case. But there was this feeling, and I and and. And what was exciting was it wasn't as intense because this person, did their family did massive damage. And it was just too complicated and not necessary. But they had it from their perspective how hurt they were by it. Not how hurt everyone would be by it. And this individual stormed off and grabbed their spouse and left. Snapped and I saw, well, that's still the same. And I looked at myself and I said, how much grace did I extend? Because my first impulse was shock and a little bit of anger, you know. Fear stepped in, uh, shock or anger, and, and I was shocked and I had to think about it for a minute and say, now listen, that person just prophesied over, to you, over you that you're not a pastor, according to their assessment. Do you agree with it? and step into the mud and begin to sling, or do you hold to what your convictions are? Are you a Christian when you're offended, when you're disrespected, or only when it's convenient? And so there was actually another person, three people actually did that to me, similar situations. And years ago, my first impulse was, if you want to see Craig, I can show you. But it won't be positive. It'll be probably one of the biggest mistakes you've ever made. Not as big as it would be for me. When you try to bring back what God says is no longer who you are, and you try to live as if you're not, you open the door for Satan to have access to you. And you step out of God's grace and mercy. And I don't know about you, but I need it every day. Amen. And so now I knew why I went. Because, of course, after fighting the food poisoning, it's never fun to go to parties where all the good food is and you can't eat any of it. That alone was punishment as far as I was concerned. But I had to analyze myself and ask myself, how should I handle things? How do you forgive when you're slighted at such a level? Especially when what was said may not be as big of an issue as the history behind it. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's simple, but it's not easy. See, to forgive anyone, you have to remove you and your emotions from the equation. And that's the first thing that Satan will strike. But what did he hit? Something that is supposed to be dead. If you flinch, then are you really dead? Is it no longer you that lives but Christ who lives in you? That is the whole thing. Or are you still alive, quite alive? And that's why it hurts. Because, see, dead people feel nothing. So I had to analyze myself and make sure I repented and I prayed for that individual. And I had to handle it. And there's a reason, and we're going to look at that. Romans says, if it is possible from your perspective, since Christ told us all things are possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace. Now, I am excellent at getting the last word. Superb. 
I'm the master of it. Always. I have a plethora of weapons to end this way. When I was not following Christ, it could be violence, size, bullying. I'm extremely articulate. And I can tear through somebody's heart and make them bleed on a dime. Satan always has given me that talent. Anybody uh, understand what I'm saying here? Are there, do we have any sharp tongue people here? Yeah. I could leave you in tears and make you end up in therapy. Okay. Getting the last word. And so to hold your tongue at, at, at such an insult, with such history, and be able to look at yourself and say, are you... Jesus in the moment. Did it really hurt? Or should it not have had any effect whatsoever? How real are you in the moment? And it is quite a challenge. I, I, I was at a party, so of course I didn't want to poop in the party, but I really did want to kind of just be like, flip some tables and say, oh, y'all, you know, because there was enough of them there. I was like, it's on. I'm not a pastor. Good. Let me show you what happens when you're not a pastor. <laughs> but I felt traumatizing a young girl at her graduation party was probably not the best thing to do. You know. Especially since what was done was really a terrible thing. And it hurt a lot of people. And I would be justified in what I said. I have Bible that I can use as a weapon to condemn them. And God said, nay, nay. Hold. The sign of a uh, good gun dog is their ability to hold. People will pay... You can pay five, six, seven, ten thousand dollars for a bird dog that'll hold. What that means is when the bird dog finds the bird, it doesn't jump on it. It stands over top of it so that the bird freezes because the birds believe that if they don't move, they're not seen. So as the dog holds, the bird will hold. And the objective is to see how long you can get the dog to hold that bird there until you walk up. Because bird hunting really is an old man's sport. Um, if you're hunting over pointers. If you're hunting over flushing dogs, it's a young man's sport because you run behind your dog, and when your dog smells the bird, it starts running, and then you run, and the dog takes you hunting, and you run all over the place, and, and then the bird goes up, and you try and stop and shoot. Pointers, they point and hold, and then you walk up. You prepare yourself. <sighs> okay. At least that's how it's supposed to work. Ken will tell you sometimes it doesn't. Tom is like, mm. Tom's like, in theory, that's why people pay a lot of money for it. Point is, the bird goes up, and you, you kick, someone kicks it, the bird goes up, you shoot it. You, the dog's supposed to retrieve it. My dogs are like, uh, don't be lazy, you know, go pick that up. <laughs> I found the bird, you pick it up, okay? We're working on it. Point is to hold. Every instinct within the dog, it's part wolf, is to attack, to catch, to kill. It's a dog. Are you? Can you learn to hold and wait? Can you learn to pull back on visceral impulses? Yes. But just as you have to train a dog, you have to train your mind to do that. You have to be able to get a hold of the mind of Christ and spend time with Jesus so you know how to handle these situations. I'll never forget there was an individual at this church who had come and did something really bad. And um, we'd worked with this individual for like 10 years, back and forth, through their addiction, through their problem, blah, 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 blah. Finally, they showed up after they had done this thing here, actually, at our church on the property. And they said, what are you going to do about it? And it was amazing. I had split straight down the middle. One side of me was like, 
I'm going to have to clean up the drywall and the blood when I'm done with you. And I was thinking how much work it's going to be sanding, trying to hide all of this. And that was one side, but my other side, all of a sudden as I go to speak and address this, because they put it point blank to me, all of these words came out of my mouth, and I'm like, no, that's not what I mean to say. And God had all totally overtaken and possessed me. And, and I was like, you know, God really can work even through these difficult situations. And I'm thinking, that's a lie. I'm, I'm lying to you. I'm t I must crush your skull. And I'm going on and on, and I'm, 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 I'm starting to have compassion for this individual. And, and, you know, I'm getting choked up. You know, God can change you, man. You don't understand. And I'm thinking, no, I cannot have worked with him for 10 years. The man needs a beating. And I remember him leaving, and I was angry that God possessed me at that moment. And all of these positive things came out of my mouth. I said, Lord, the, Lord, the man deserves to be crushed. And God, remind me, his grace and his mercy is new every morning. And for by the grace of God, there go I. Therefore, it is our objective as Christians, our goal, our mission, if you choose to take it, which seems impossible, is to win someone back to a position of peace and unity. We have to be trying to win them back to God's grace and mercy, freeing them from the sin they've committed against us, or we have committed against them. Not extract justice or avoid punishment for the situation. For God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay, Romans 12, 19. The problem is, I believe God is delinquent on his payments often for me. I would prefer to see him actually crush some people. You know what I'm saying? Ha-ha! And then you walk by and you go, ha-ha! Touched not the Lord's anointed. What did you learn? Now kiss my ring. I see I'm around all these saved people. I apologize for being too real here. I... God, pray for me. But God says, how will you extend my hand instead of reaching out yours? It's much larger than yours. It's much more efficacious. Where are you at in your mind? God says that he is a God of justice. Isaiah 30, verse 18. The Lord longs to be gracious to us. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. But it also says, for the Lord is a God of justice. So to summarize, we're commanded to forgive and to seek forgiveness and justice to, or looking to avoid consequences of our actions and, uh, not the, and look at the issue from God's perspective. To take that issue under the ideal or, or, or look at that issue and find a way to build relationship and restore because God has the church in the business of restoration to walk in his mercy and his grace, and to grant that daily. So every time people treat us in an ill manner, speak evil of us, or to make unreasonable demands, they're giving us an opportunity to grow and to react as Christ did, conforming us into the image of his son. Even if you've been fighting food poisoning, you've had a challenging day, you're around people who did tremendous damage to yourself, your family, your church, and still have the hubris and arrogance to disrespect you. Even in those moments, God is giving us an opportunity to do more and to show his power. You're not a Christian because you say so. You're a Christian because you show so. The Bible says we are to count it all joy when we encounter various situations, according to James 1, 2. For we are being transformed by the experience to be like Jesus, by how we respond instead of react. But let's back up for a minute. Is this helping anybody? How do we avoid sinful behavior that requires forgiveness in the first place? It's very simple. The first step is to recognize in your flesh that you have a propensity towards sin and that your flesh is still under 
a law to sin. Your soul is still under the law of sin. Sin still rules in your mortal body. You are made up of 62 to 68% water. Water goes to the area of least resistance. It is easier to sit down at a barca lounger and relax than it is to train at a gym. Your body loves to go into a time of rest, and people will encourage that. And there is a time for rest, but there's a time for everything. And most of the time, it is not a time for you to rest in allowing God to work into your life. He's the one who decides when you rest because he is the God of rest. We don't. Well, I'll get to it. I'll handle it later. I don't know if I'm ready. I'm not sure about this. Let me see what happens. I'm not. And that's called yim yang. You learned that in seminary, yim yang. Has anyone ever experienced yim yang? Anyone ever give you the yim yang? Ken is actually writing a, a book on yim yang. The things people say to me that I'm not happy about. I think that's the subtitle. Um, they give you the runaround, the yim yang, the whatever, because they want to dance with you as if you've put on music instead of get real and stand on what God has told them to do. Well, Pastor, you don't know the trouble I've nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Number two, the next, once you realize it is natural to sin and to strike back, is to realize your willpower is not stronger than your propensities. You do not have the power to not sin in yourself. I don't care how stubborn you are. Talked to a gentleman one time at the, at the gym, and he was telling me about how he had quit smoking. I said, well, praise God. He said, no, not praise God. Praise me. He said, I'm the one who did it. God had nothing to do with it. I said, really? He said, yeah. I did it on my own, on my own, once again. I said, let me ask you a question. Uh, you said you believe in God. Yeah. I said, so then God created everything. Yeah. I said, he created you. Yeah. So he created you for a purpose. Yeah. And he makes your heart beat. Yeah. So then he made your mind work because, of course, your heart pumping blood into your brain caused you to think, right? Yeah. And so the ability then to think to not smoke really did come from him eventually, didn't it? It had nothing to do with you because otherwise you'd be dead. And he got a little offended because he was so proud of what he had accomplished. But I asked him, I said, so you quit smoking, but you're here in the gym and you're over 200 pounds. <laughs> I said, you didn't quit any addiction. You just swapped one. You didn't get free. You just stopped doing one and picked up another. Addiction is a spirit that will morph based on what you will allow it to do in your life. So you can quit smoking and you can take up overeating. You can quit overeating and then you become very religious and critical of everyone else and you become a gossiper and judgmental. Until you're freed of the addiction, you're not free. I used to run a 12-step program in, in, in a three-quarter house. And I used to go to those meetings, and I'd listen to them, and they'd tell me about how, you know, they were free from this, and they haven't done it and everything, and then they'd go and they'd drink 12 cups of coffee with 50 sugars in it. And then they would step outside for a break halfway through the meeting to smoke, and they would hotbox that bad boy, you know what I'm saying? And they'd come in going, so excited, I got my keychain. It's been a year since I've been free. I said, you ever notice why they only give you a plastic keychain? Because that's, that's about the value of your freedom there, buddy, because you never got free. You just switched. When you get the gold watch, then you might start talking about freedom. Come on, somebody. When you get a crown in glory, then you can start talking about freedom. But until then, you just flip-flopping and playing games with people. Okay. The Bible says, as did the Oxford group, who started the 12 steps, that you can be completely set free. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Not in morphing to what's more socially acceptable.
you do not have the power to not sin. Yesterday, I did not have, not the, I did not have the power in my flesh, especially my flesh was weak as it was. I love when God challenges you when you're sick. That's my favorite. Oh, yay. Not when I've been prayed up, you know, had my Bible time, just came from a Holy Ghost revival. Belly full of pasta, because that's always, I'm quite spiritual after I'm eaten. And then someone gives me some small little insult that I overlook and feel great about myself. No, no. I just got into a size 32 pant after an 18-hour time on the throne, and in so doing, I was slightly weak and uncomfortable and not able to eat the goodies in front of me. Two challenges at once, and then here comes the onslaught. You'd think God would give us a break. Tell us it's coming. Send a memo. But then would it be as efficacious? Jesus could have just been nailed to the cross, but first they beat him. First, they didn't feed him. First, they left him exhausted and didn't let him sleep. First, they kept him from water. His friends had to abandon him. He had to be humiliated in front of his mother and that woman and John naked. Then he gets to minister. Go in the ministry, they said. They said it'd be fun, they said. Things they leave out of the brochure. Yet it is in the brochure. Read it. It's in Matthew, it's in Mark, it's in Luke, it's in John. See, supernatural power isn't just speaking in tongues and prophecy. See, being able to forgive when every part of your being wants to lash out. And especially when you're right. When you're right, I'll tell you. There's something about being right over being righteous that is much more intoxicating. See, we can be right and say, I was right, but are you righteous? Jesus never called us to be right. Religious people are always trying to be right, have the right word, do the right thing, say the right thing at the right moment, at the right, right, right. But does that make you righteous? Because just because you can doesn't mean you should. It's like big people wearing thongs. Not always the best. Well, I have a right. Do you? You know, Jesus had the right to kill everyone there. They were defiling and disrespecting the king of kings. And he says, Father, forgive them. How is this possible? It is the only reason that I have stayed in the ministry was that moment in the Bible. Because I saw something. I like power. Okay, that's why I never did drugs, because I don't understand the concept of not being in power. I like the rush. I like adrenaline. I like to see manifestation of power. I have never seen more power in the Bible, being raised in it and all that, than when Jesus stretched out, nude, humiliated, starving, dehydrating, at his lowest point, and he says, Father, forgive them. That's power. To be able to go, what was that, a fly? Can't touch this. It meant nothing. Like water off a duck's back, he just shook it off. You have to have it like that, if I may be a little bit goody, to do it like that. I always say that our, our president right now, you can actually steal $1,000 from him, and he will sleep very well that night. Not think twice about it. Wouldn't be bothered. Because he's got it like that. He can light his cigars with a $100 bill. If anybody here got taken for a grand, at least most of us, we may have a little problem with that. Might be a little bent. Little. But because he has it like that, can this third dimensional world full of sinners 
show you you don't have it like that? Can, can they rob you of your bank of emotional stability because of a word that they say? It's like people walk around with only $5 in their pocket. Yet they have a bank account full of thousands. How foolish. You need more than $5 a day. My wife will tell you that. She takes everything out of my wallet in case she has just $5. That's how she is. Like, I can't walk, so I can walk around with no money. Well, what about me? It's not the point. When we got married, she said, what's yours is mine and what's mine is mine, and that's how it's going to be. I don't even know why I carry a wallet. It's really just for show. Occasionally, she'll put money in it and take it back out. It's just, you know, just for a moment, just to make me feel like a man, you know. Here's some money. Thank you. I needed this to pay off a bill. That's terrible. Do you have it like that to forgive? How deep are your pockets? It all depends on what you want to access. Number three, after recognizing your flesh has a propensity towards sin, two, you don't have the power to overcome it, you have to acknowledge and believe that there is another power. Say another power. Another government that Paul talked about outside of his own body, that if you choose, say choose, to place your faith in, will help you overcome your sin because of its power working in you. You have to walk possessed of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you are possessed of something else. Pick your possession. Tell your neighbor, pick your possession. In other words, what you believe empowers you to change one way or the other. So let me give you a little brain teaser. This is going to upset the theologians in the room. Defeat in the faith is actually caused by trying harder not to sin. The harder you try not to, the more you will fail. It is the arrogant person who believes that they have the power in their own will to stop sinning. If we try too hard to not sin, God then won't give us his grace to overcome it because he'll say, oh, well, when you're done, I'll help you out. I've watched my wife do this on a few occasions when she's gone to do something that involved a little bit more power than what she thought. I, of course, knew the power that was going to be needed and, of course, had the power. She, of course, thought she had the power and found out she didn't have the power because she wanted to fight the power. <laughs> to which I said, when you're done with that, after she's trying to move, here, I got it, I got it. You want me to help? I've got, leave me alone. And finding her exhaustion, I move her out of the way and open the jar and hand it. That's really the purpose of being a man is just to open the mayonnaise jar. That is your job. He did it. It's like uh, Bugs Bunny when he was on the crusher back in the day of cartoons. So I've never heard anybody say that in the gym to lift weights, but apparently that works for some people, especially females. I pick things up, I put them down. I know my job. How many of us are trying to live our faith by, we got it, God, we got it, we got it. He says, no, you don't have it. But I do, and I want to give it. Are you willing to allow me to? Let me take you a little further, can I? Good, because I have the mic and I'm not done. There are four kinds of forgiveness we're going to discuss. We're going to get a little theological. I, I pride myself on the people who leave this church. You may not be the best Christians, but you will be highly educated on if you're not. I, I will never have a church where people have live in a false sense that they're okay from the perspective that in themselves they can do it. 
We will always be a church that has to depend on Jesus. Always. I'm okay, you're okay is a lie. Outside of Jesus Christ, we're nothing. He has to be our everything. Four kinds of forgiveness. Eternal, number one, which we receive at salvation. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. We receive eternal forgiveness at salvation. The second is borrowed forgiveness through what Christ did for us. John, two, uh, John 20, verse 22. Then there is communal forgiveness that we receive from the confession of sin one to another that restores our Christian walk. And that's 1 John 1, 9. And then finally, governmental forgiveness. And it's when God removes his hand of discipline from us and doesn't deal with us after a manner that he usually did when we had not learned to submit to him. And that's Matthew 6, 14 through 15. And that is what I want to finish with, this message discussing. So please listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Turn with me to Hebrews 12, 10. Are you still with me? The Bible says, in our flesh dwells no good thing. Nothing good dwells in your flesh. It dwells in your spirit. It's supposed to be manifest through your soul, which then manifests in the body, and this, this through the body. And this is really the issue. Hebrews 12.10 says that all discipline of God is profitable that we may be partakers of his holiness. Our series on Thursdays about antinomianism. That without holiness, no man shall see God. You say, then we have to try harder to be holy. No, because that's not holy. That says, God, sit down, I've got it. Holiness is when you come to a level of repentance and humility and say, without you, I can do nothing. And this is done over time, slowly, to conform us into the image of his son. So let me be clear. You are not fully saved when you pray the prayer of salvation. Okay? This individual who was kind of aggressive with me yesterday was telling me about someone who had gotten saved okay, because of a situation that had happened. And I always find that fascinating. When something just happens, the Christian church always jumps at that. Look, look, they're saved, they're saved. As if it's something new or miraculous from the perspective of it's not supposed to be happening as usual. Now, don't get me wrong. I think the greatest miracle is salvation. Um, there's nothing more fascinating than to see a transformed life. But they are not fully transformed just because they say the prayer. There are lots of people who hold to the idea that once you say the prayer, you're good. And then they go on to live their own life. Again, antinomianism, the idea that you can sin and not have a sense of holiness. That you know, We just accept everyone's sin. We accept everybody in. We become Hillsong, New York, you know with the two men who said they are now married and leading worship, pray for that church or whatever you want to call that place now. I would call it anathema. Okay. It's a church apparently that Justin Bieber and several famous people go to. That scares me. I still pray for him. I pray he comes to the knowledge of the truth. God is very specific, and he is vetting his church even as we speak. And this is why we preach these type of messages. We have to look at ourselves. Yesterday, I was really, I had all of the, I mean, she, they, this individual was looking down a howitzer of accusation and Bible, and I could have blown this individual right out of the water. And God said, unload and stand down. We're not looking to destroy. We're looking to restore. 
You're not fully saved when you pray the prayer of salvation, but you do start the process of salvation to bring you to full salvation. Please pay very close attention. I am a theologian. For salvation is not only a moment in time, but it is a transformation over time. What makes you saved is the process. But the process is not completed because you said the prayer. It's staying in the process that validates the salvation, not just saying it and coming to church. Can you be totally disrespected after years of stuff that you thought was done? And when it's brought back up to find out if it is actually dead or not, you can still count it all joy. See, just because you bury something doesn't mean you've gotten over it. Time does not heal all wounds. Jesus does. Time just gives you an opportunity to bury things that you don't want to deal with, and eventually you will find a very large, bald-headed man who will take you through the seven steps and cause you to feel what you did want to feel, and then you'll be angry with him and uh, for who knows how long, maybe leave the church, then two years later realize, "Uh uh-oh, that was a great thing, it was from God, and you say thank you. Meanwhile, I'm still tore up from the experience, but that's the joys of being, you know, in the past. Everything I said, I'm sorry, so I guess it's over. Even though they ripped you for two and a half hours, you know? And of course, you have to be gracious and say, well, of course, I understand. I hope you die. Uh... You can go to heaven, but I hope you die. You know what I'm saying? I... No, I don't think a lot about that. But um, I would have never, you have to understand, back when I was backslidden doing my other profession, no one would have gotten two words out from what has been said to me. They would have not been able to speak because they would have been trying to remove my fist from their throat. <laughs> and God said, no. How well we handle God saying no is really indicative of our faith. It's terribly painful because I want what I want when I want. I want to see justice extracted on people I want. One individual did such damage to me that in the, right now the individual has leukemia. And they're dying. And I believe there is a correlation with how they treated me and their disease. I'm not saying that God did that because of me. I'm saying that because they did that, they placed themselves in a position for Satan to, of course, enter their life. And he's now killing them. And you'd think with the damage that this individual did, which was thousands of dollars, and pretty much put a big kink in my career, that I would feel justified. What he did to me and my family and everything, you got what you deserve. But if you're saved, you have a different sense about it, a sadness. I don't feel positive about it. I don't feel good at all. Justice will never make you feel good. I don't believe even that when you get to heaven, if if God would allow you to see the people who hurt you in hell, that that would give you some sense of solace. I think we'd be so much with the heart of Christ that we would weep. Therefore, salvation from hell comes to those in the process of full salvation. As long as you're in the college of salvation You are and shall be saved as you learn the lessons presented to you. So one is a gift from Christ. The other comes through the discipline of the Holy Spirit. Salvation at that moment is from Christ. Salvation over time is through the Holy Spirit's process in your life. See, many confuse satanic accusations with the conviction. So to help you know the satanic condemnation versus conviction, satanic condemnation for sin or anything you do, is never clear or sharp. It's kind of vague and ambiguous. It's foggy. Leaving you a sense of hopelessness and depression, where God's conviction is very sharp. Can I get an amen from somebody? Clear, to the point, with tons of Bible behind it. 
with a very clear direction towards grace and mercy. And so Satan draws carnal Christians, these I said the prayer, I'm good types, through temptation to sin. But the mature, he stifles through accusation and guilt and the trick bag of navel-gazing. And so Satan knows how to affect us. I hope this is helping somebody here today. I hope I ain't putting you all to sleep here. See, the steps of a righteous man are ordered of God, even steps through the valley of the shadow of death, surrounded by the most disrespectful people that deserve to be struck upside the head with a two-by-four. And he tells you to hug them. I'll never, ever, ever forget the time when an individual who had um, hurt my mom was going to judge me on my credentials, which was supposed to be a 10-minute, rather super flurry of just technicality. Two and a half hours later, after being accused of all kinds of things I did not do, and told by the pastor that I was under, no matter what they say to you, do not flinch and do not say a word. And as they went through all of these false accusations, I looked at my brand new bride and she began to weep because she knew they were lies. And I sat there. Now, not only did this individual hurt my mother, cause damage to my father's progress and salvation, hindered my forward progress in my career, was taking out on me the end of his, in his frustrations with others in the church compounded. But now you made my brand new bride cry. Now I'm going to kill you. Touch my mom, you're going to get stroked. Touch my wife, you're going to get choked. And I had to sit there and I felt inside of myself just shaking with rage. And the individuals who were critiquing me said, Now, we've heard all of these accusations against you, but we feel gracious that we're going to give you a chance to prove yourself as a minister. And we're going to allow you to be credentialed because this man who has been accusing you for two and a half hours said we should. You really owe him your license, your credentialing, and your calling. And they had me hug him. You want me to hug him? <laughs> so you want me to put my fist in the center of his back? Squeeze him, diving forward, and sever his spinal cord. You want me access to him as my wife is crying. And I've been falsely accused. People insane. And so I stood up, and in my every aspect of who I was, and all of a sudden I felt something. And this has happened a couple times in my life. I believe it's maybe my guardian angel, could be the Holy Spirit. I don't know. You ascribe it who you want to. But something comes over me like a uh, straitjacket, a very strange thing. And inside of me, I'm trembling. And this possession overcomes me. And I hug the individual and I thank them when what wanted to come out of my mouth was not that. Because first of all, my calling is not based on any man. Paul said that. They were just simply going to be agreeing with God, and they were in sin to not agree with God. I'm a pastor until I die. That's why I don't go by my first name, why I continue to hold to that title, and people can say all kinds of things about it. I don't care. God said it, and if you agree with God, you agree with me. And it's that simple. It doesn't flinch. 
But the point was, at that moment, I felt this thing come over me. Got in the car, and it left me. And it was good, because everyone had driven away, and that's when I had a total conniption. Because she was still crying. And I had to say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That was my validation that I was called to be a pastor and that I was saved, not what they said in a little stupid piece of paper with a fake gold stamp on it. That didn't mean anything. Are you supposed to get this real as a pastor? Or am I supposed to do this? What do I care? The church is paid off, right? It's ours. No. Ah, that's, so did that come out? Oh, this is on. Oh, should have saw that coming. I was like, hit the button. I couldn't get the button. And this church is so large, you know, you probably wouldn't have heard me, right? Please remember that if you fall, God's grace gives us the ability to, re to return to where we fell. And he'll say, get back up and try again. There was a poet I read about that guy. He's, Ravi Zacharias reads it, so it's always fabulous. Because Ravi Zacharias is a poet. But he, he talks about this poet, and he, the poet wrote about his day, and in so doing, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, you know, I had made a mess with my work, and I didn't accomplish, and I failed. And I go to my teacher, and the teacher takes it and crumples it up and throws it away, but gives me a fresh piece of paper every day and says, start again. It's that fresh piece of paper that gives us the ability to walk in our Christian faith, to rewrite the day, rewrite the wrong, rewrite the moment. You get a do-over from what you failed to do. So I said all this to say that when dealing with forgiveness, if we render judgment towards a fellow believer or a potential believer, without a sense of godly tears or loss, we ignore our mandate to seek peace, unity, and brotherhood. You ignore that. Even if you have to correct someone, does it grieve you? People say, when should I go approach someone who's hurt me? I said, when going bothers you the second time. There are two times it will bother you when you have to go and make something right with somebody. The initial in which you're angry and say, I have a right not to. And then the second time when you realize how it will actually hurt the other person when you do when the compassion will have to be expressed. The first time it's about you. The second time when it's about them, that's when you go and you correct the person. I will repeat that. The very first time you have a sense that you have to correct something that was wrong done to you, and you feel you're wronged and your focus is on you, and I'm going to tell them off, I'm going to let them have it, don't do it. Even if you're biblically right, don't do it. When do you do it? When you have a compassion for the wounded individual who wounded you because hurting people hurt people. When you can have empathy for who you have to correct, that's when you go and do it. And that doesn't give you an excuse, well, that leaves me a lot of time because I'm going to be a while. Um, I wouldn't play that if I were you. I've known people who let that sit. Just recently I dealt with someone whose relative committed suicide, drug addict, killed themselves with an overdose. And as, as I was talking to her, she had this grief come over her, and I, I thought it was really weird. It was different. It wasn't about the death. She said, I hadn't talked to this individual in a long time because they owed me $6, and I felt slighted. So I didn't talk to them. 
And I wonder if I could have said something that might have made a difference. Six dollars. What does heroin go for now? For uh, Does anyone know? Back in the day, it was $20 for, Turk, for, for Mexican brown. $20 is still the going rate? About 20 bucks. Yeah, see. Inflation had no effect on drugs. How good is that? She was worried about $6, $20, took him. $14 gap could have put him in hell because she said the individual cursed God around him often, and she doesn't know if, of course, he ever made heaven, and that was oh, so unsettling. $6. No compassion. God, I've given him compassion over and over and over and over. How many times, Lord, must I forgive them? 70 times 7. 490 times, I've surpassed that in the last 10 years. And he said that has never been the number of exactness, but it is actually a principle of constant. If they repent, forgive. That doesn't mean become codependent. That doesn't mean allow them to hurt you. And definitely don't lend them six bucks again. But the point is, so let me ask. Do we really grieve for those who have sinned against us? Not because they sinned against us, but because they were in a spiritual condition to cause the sin in the first place. Does it grieve us for the prodigals of the faith or cause indignation, condemnation, and a demand for justice? For being religious and judgmental and being right is easy, but it isn't Christian. I'll repeat that. Being religious and judgmental and right is easy, but not Christian. For without love, 1 Corinthians 13 says, you are just making noise like a clanging symbol of the faith. 1 John 4, 7. Turn with me there, and then we're going to close today. And we're going to close differently, something we don't normally do. I'm going to ask you to come to the altar and kneel or kneel at your chair. And I want you to pray for your unsaved loved ones. I want you to pray for those who have hurt you. And I want you to pray for those that you've hurt. So three. The unsaved those you've hurt, and those who have hurt you. And let's read. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Therefore, anyone who does not know God does not truly love. Talked to someone the other day. They were so frustrated. Why can't they love me? I said, because they don't know what love is. They don't love themselves. They don't love God. Until you, people say, you cannot love someone until you love yourself. No, no. You cannot love someone until you know the love of God for you. God is love. Everything else is infatuation. That marriage, look, it's so loving. Not necessarily. It might just be great sex and they've learned how to get along. But that's not love. It might be just infatuation. It must be they really like each other. But love is manifest when it's challenged. And the married people said, Amen. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us, that he sent his one and only son into the world that, he, that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and that he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, and that's God the Father, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. That is your mission. Paul 
killed, imprisoned, tortured, abused the Christians, thinking he was right. God struck him blind. He has an encounter with God, becomes Paul instead of Saul, makes the transition, starts using a different title or a different ideal. And the man who was sent to get him, who he was running from, he brings to the church of the people he has been persecuting and their families who were killed because of his hand. And they allow him to be their pastor and teach them how to love. This insane experience, this supernatural what the, is why the people at Antioch were called Christians. You're just like that God you serve. Can people call you a Christian? Or do you have to call yourself a Christian because it's not really seen by anyone else? If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. To love our fellow believers is to forgive or seek their forgiveness and to sacrifice our rights to serve and perfect them towards Christ. So if it gives you any solace when you are in these positions and you feel that you have been beaten down, you have not been beaten down, but you have actually been elevated up above them to lift them up to him. It's how you see it. Did they beat you down or did God elevate you to be lifted up to draw them up? So to brag of our love for God and not manifest it towards the world and those we are commanded to love is cowardly and is incomplete. And I call any of you who are holding unforgiveness against anyone a coward. If you don't release it and leave it here today. And the Bible says in Revelation 12, the cowardly and the fearful will not enter heaven. Acts 11.26, we earned the name Christians by the love that we showed. So are you a cowardly Christian looking to avoid punishment and consequences instead of seeking forgiveness and unity? Are you afraid to extend love to the unlovable, the unloving, and those who hurt you? Or... Will you choose you this day whom you serve? If the worship team would come forward.